Hello. Hello. Well, welcome. You're welcome. 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 Hello. Welcome. 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 Hello and a warm welcome to the Parish of Herne Hills online service. I'm Trevor, one of the readers in the parish, and it's great to have you with us. I'd like to particularly welcome anyone new or who hasn't been a regular worshipper in one of our churches. Today is Remembrance Sunday and at the start of our time of prayer in our online service we shall have a time to be quiet and remember those who have given their lives in times of war. Otherwise we pick up again in our series of sermons looking at the Apostles' Creed and how the ancient words can have meaning for us today. Ben Hughes one of our associate vicars will be speaking to us on the words, He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. Our music this week comes from our own parish musicians and St Martin's voices. We begin our service with a prayer reminding us why we're coming together today. The words are on the screen. We are worshipping together wherever we are as a family of God in our Father's presence to offer him praise and thanksgiving, to hear and receive his holy word, to bring before him the needs of the world and to ask his forgiveness of our sins and to seek his grace that through his son Jesus Christ we may give ourselves to his service. Amen. Our opening hymn is one that's often sung on Remembrance Sunday and reminds us that God is our refuge in times of trouble. O oh God, our help in ages past. Thank you.
now take the time to reflect on our relationship with God. We'll have a few moments quiet to acknowledge that we have often failed to love God and our neighbour. War and threats of war afflict many nations. Our actions have scarred our planet. All too often our thoughts and deeds fall short of what is best. But if we confess our sins, God is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And so we confess. Please join me in the words on the screen. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, we have sinned against you and against our neighbour in thought and word and deed, through negligence, through weakness, through our own deliberate fault. We are truly sorry and repent of all our sins. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, who died for us, forgive us all that is past and grant that we may serve you in newness of life to the glory of your name. Amen. May the God of love bring us back to himself, forgive us our sins, and assure us of his eternal love. In Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. And now we have our Bible reading, and then we'll hear from Ben. Our Bible reading is from Acts chapter 1, verses 1 to 11. In my former book, Theophilus, I wrote about all that Jesus began to do and to teach until the day he was taken up to heaven after giving instructions through the Holy Spirit to the apostles he had chosen. After his suffering, he presented himself to them and gave many convincing proofs that he was alive. He appeared to them over a period of 40 days and spoke about the kingdom of God. On one occasion, while he was eating with them, he gave them this command. Do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift my father promised, which you have heard me speak about. For John baptised with water, but in a few days you will be baptised with the Holy Spirit. Then they gathered round him and asked, Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom to Israel? He said to them, It is not for you to know the times or dates the Father has set by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. After he said this, he was taken up before their very eyes and a cloud hid him from their sight. They were looking intently up into the sky as he was going when suddenly two men dressed in white stood beside them. Men of Galilee, they said, why do you stand here looking into the sky? This same Jesus, who has been taken from you into heaven, will come back in the same way you have seen him go into heaven. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Good morning. Today's sermon is a continuation of our sermon series based on the creed. And today we'll, we'll be looking at the nature and the stuff, substance of Jesus Christ. But before I begin, let us pray. Heavenly Father, help us understand you more. Help us know your Son. Thank you for him, for sending him into the world to save us. Amen. To understand the part about Jesus in the Creed, we have to begin with the history lesson. If you imagine a pebble being dropped into a pond, you will see ripples spread out in concentric circles. If you shout 
in a silent space, sound will spread out in spherical waves. The life of Jesus is as an explosion, the shock waves reverberating through time and history still felt today. Those events in Jerusalem immediately after the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ and the miraculous stories of Jesus' life inspired by the Holy Spirit, they spread out by word of mouth. Messengers, storytellers, travellers, missionaries, zealots, they shared their version of the gospel along the highways and byways of the ancient world. The trade routes from town to town, seaports, ships, led to churches of believers beginning to settle and grow. At the same time as Paul was writing his letters, other ecclesia, or other churches, were being established in North Africa, Asia Minor, Sub-Saharan Africa, India, Spain, all around the ports of the Black Sea, and even our own British Isles through our tin routes. And of course, we all know about the Mediterranean Basin, which was basically St Paul's sphere of influence. We know that from his letters. The point here is that the gospel message was not just a Mediterranean religion contained within the limits of the Roman world, as some parts of the church still like us to believe. But the message had spread everywhere. But as the gospel spread rapidly, replacing and absorbing many local religions and superstitions, and as quickly as some authorities tried to repress its growth, the gospel just grew, eventually becoming the official faith of many crown and states worldwide. But the problem with this speed and this growth, it was still a predominantly oral and verbal storytelling message. And under significant persecution. So the question arose was how to retain a consistency of truth and a consistency of doctrine. And if so, which Christian denomination were to define that truth? So in AD 600, the problem became not just a theological difficult one due to the power, size and influence of some of the Christian denominations, namely the Roman Catholics and Eastern Orthodox, but rising disagreements over doctrine interpretation were leading to a schism and potential war. The risk for this church was Christian believers would not agree and so tear themselves apart from the inside out, and that would not do. And there was another problem around this time. There were the beginnings and rapid growth of two subsects of Christianity, both beginning as oral renditions of a gospel conversion and local to their areas. One which later became Islam and the other was the Donatists. Now the Donatists were particularly alarming at this time because they were growing very rapidly. They were convenient for believers and had a very different view on the nature of Jesus than the rest of the church. So the main bodies of the church got together and decided on a codex of faith a folio of texts which they put together as the New Testament and a statement that all Christians would agree on and say every time that they met. This of course became the creed from the word credo, I believe. A good idea, but it actually took decades to all put together. And it was the bit about the nature of Jesus they came to blows over. Stirred up by the Donatist row over body and soul, it got so bad in these creedal debates that in the end, the only solution was to fudge it, arguing that human known language was insufficient to actually describe the nature and substance of Christ. So in the end, we have two creeds, possibly a three. The Apostles' Creed, which was the basic everyday focal teen version used in baptisms, and the Nicene Creed, or the Nicene Creed, the other creed, 
which covers the theology of belief as well as the doctrine of true faith. And it was trying to describe the substance of Christ, the very nature of Christ, that was the crux of the issue that caused all the problems. So, there we are. We were left with the words, which we still have today. We believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father. And here's the difficult bit. God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made, for us men and for our salvation. The light from light, the begotten not made, of one being with God, true God from true God, you know, they are all part of the compromise. The fudge of words, light from light, that really do not solve anything about the problem of Jesus and his substance. And to be honest, it is still a systematic problem today. Now you may say, ah, this is not important, but it is, you see, for the church. How we understand the nature of Jesus is very important to people and key for world peace. Today is yesterday. Especially the true God from true God line. I mean, this is not the place or time to get into a creedal debate, but let us note we as Anglicans exist because of the difference in our interpretation of what Christ means to us. And as evangelicals within the Anglican communion, us becoming part or pure substance in Christ is key. Well, let's just leave all that discussion before we all fall out, as they did back then. But let us look a bit more about what this substance of Christ means. Now, I'm going to ask you a question. Is it Batman or Superman? Which camp are you in? Born of the Virgin, Superman. Suffered under Pontius Pilate, Batman. You see, if you're a Batman fan, you know Batman is born of suffering and trauma. His superpowers come from himself, his training, his dedication to fitness. He is fully human and feels it to the core. He hurts and is wounded in his battles. His fight against evil, but he persists in his pursuit of justice, driven by a desire born from suffering and sin. On the other hand, if Superman is your thing, then you are probably more of a messian- you have probably more of a messianic, messianic persuasion. Born of noble birth on a distant planet, Superman with his superpowers and special privileges given to him at birth. Superman comes down to us and his mission is to save the planet from Satan, Lex Luthor, and evil, Kryptonite. Humans are the battlefield. The war is above us, around us, and despite us. We can never be Superman, though, as hard as we try. But we can be like his alter ego, Clark Kent. But we will never be Superman. We cannot fly and do all the stuff that Superman does. Because, frankly put, we are not super. We are of a different substance. So there it is, take your pick. If Jesus is fully human, then we can all in time become like him. We all have that potential, born of suffering and sin. And given the right kit, like Batman, the belts, cars, bikes and copters and all that, or rather the spiritual equivalents, prayer, reading, the Bibles, singing worship, doing this, doing that, we will all be super one day. But can we be Jesus? We cannot be, because my substance and your substance is human flesh and human soul. I can never be anything other than that, because we are not born of virgins. We were not fathered by the Holy Spirit. We are called, yes, but not called as messiahs. Jesus is the only messiah. See, it all gets rather complicated. We can never be like him. We can only hope that one day we can be transformed into his likeness, grafted into his body. So we have the light from light, the true God from true God, begotten, not made of one being with the Father. That is the language, and as far as language could go, 
and has remained thus ever since. But there is something very helpful that we can take today and that provides us with a better understanding and hope of how we can relate to Jesus as our Saviour. And it is actually the cross itself, Calvary. Now in my sermon I will have an actual cross, so I want you to imagine a cross. The cross is a strange logo to have for a worldwide religion. Christianity is the only religion where the logo is a weapon of torture. I mean, what religion would have an electric chair or a noose as its principal logo? But the cross is the heart of the gospel. Christianity is embedded in the suffering of a cruel world. Messiah or self-made hero, when you add the cross, they both lead to the same thing. Destruction, pain, suffering at the hand of others, for the hand of others. Jesus' calling was that of sacrifice. The salvation and victory does not come through heroic deeds, but through the cross. Jesus is God from God, but on the cross there had to be a complete separation. That bond broke. Christ had to be abandoned by God in order to make the cross work. God had to turn his back on his son. And it's not losing to gain. This was a dynamic risk. Death may have held on to Christ, you see, through one small thing that Christ had got wrong. Death would have made its claim, and that would have been Jesus, dead and buried, and no resurrection. But as Jesus was blameless and perfect, Remember, creation is good, Jesus is perfect. Jesus burst from the grave as light from light and with a force and power to save. If we as humans could be perfect like him, I'm sure the laws of theological physics would allow us to do the same. But death has its hold on me and you because of our sin and we can do nothing about that. But Jesus can and he has. Because, yes, at his birth he was fully God, but in his death he is fully human. Jesus, the body on the cross, was fully human and fully perfect in his humanity. Now the cross extends vertically. Its post is driven into the soil of earth. The post is called the stipes. That post is driven into the same earth that Jesus mixed with spit to make the blind see. The same earth as the devil tempted Jesus to make bread from. The same earth Lazarus was entombed within. It is the same earth of the promised land and the same dust and dirt that Jesus washed from his disciples' feet. That vertical post of the cross is planted in the realities of a sordid world of soil and dirt and dust. But it extends and points upwards towards heaven. You see... The cross connects earth to heaven through Jesus' body. Jesus' body on that vertical post pours out blood and water so that we can be symbolically clean and our souls washed through his most precious blood. Through him, despite us. And like a squirrel that runs up and down a tree trunk, the Holy Spirit runs up and down the cross of Christ, interceding for us from earth to heaven and from heaven to earth through our prayers, hope and supplications. There is no way we can communicate to heaven and vice versa without the cross. Everything goes through Jesus. And then the cross beam, called the Patabulim, carries Jesus' arms outstretched to save the world. Jesus, the Messiah, the Superman, come down from the cross they hail to him. Jesus, nailed to the cross by human hands, but opening his arms wide to save us, to embrace us and to welcome us and love us, despite the fact they do not know what they are doing. So the cross is key to faith. Saying the creed does not save us. It is Jesus dying on the cross that saves. The cross reminds us of the cost of our salvation, and however you dress your cross up, 
with gold or gilt or baubles, or if you prefer, just plain wood, it is still a brutal and unforgiving symbol of suffering. It is a reminder of the true love of God who was prepared to sacrifice his son to save us. The cross was a means of torture and a symbol of death, but it's now become a symbol of life. Finally, the cross is still divisive today because Jesus remains controversial. Nations, communities, families and friends will never really agree when it comes to faith in Christ. Christians are still being persecuted for their faith in following Christ. But we are to remain steadfast in faith because Jesus' kingdom is still being formed. The best is yet to come. And today is remembrance. Remembrance Sunday serves to help us remember those that have made the ultimate sacrifice of laying down one's life for others. But remembrance is also an attribute of the cross of Christ. It is an action alongside sacrifice, worship, memorial, majesty, sanctification, restoration, charity, love, prayer. And so the splinters of the cross made up of all those words and others. Christ teaches and grows us in to be those things. So when in the creedal debates they talked about the substance of Christ, the substance of Christ are these attributes and behaviours and he demands us to do likewise. The substance of the cross or the substance of Christ is being in deed and in action, not just in word alone. The words of the creed help us better understand what we should believe, but it's the actions that proceed from that belief that makes us whole in Christ. Amen. We begin our prayers with an act of remembrance. Please join me in the response on the screen. God is our shelter and strength, always ready to help in times of trouble. So we will not be afraid, even if the earth is shaken and the mountains fall into the ocean depths, even if seas roar and rage and the hills are shaken by violence. There is a river that brings joy to the city of God, to the sacred house of the Most High. God is in that city and it will never be destroyed. At early dawn, he will come to its aid. Nations are terrified, kingdoms are shaken, God thunders and the earth dissolves. The Lord Almighty is with us. The God of Jacob is our refuge. Come and see what the Lord has done. See what amazing things he has done on earth. He stops wars all over the world. He breaks bows, destroys spears and sets shields on fire. Stop fighting and know that I am God, supreme among the nations, supreme over the world. The Lord Almighty is with us. The God of Jacob is our refuge. Amen. Let us thank God for those who laid down their lives for our freedom. Let us think of those who suffer as a result of war and pray for them. They shall not grow old as we who are left grow old. Age shall not weary them nor the years condemn. At the going down of the sun and in the morning, we will remember them. We will remember them.
And now we continue our prayers with a prayer of petition for those affected by war. God of justice and peace, we pray for those who have been injured or disabled through war, for those who have lost homes and security through conflict, for those who have lost loved relatives in wars, for those who face danger and take risks for peace, for all those, especially children, caught up in current conflicts, for refugees and all those in need of aid and other help. We bring before you the people of Ukraine. God of encouragement and saviour of the despairing, comfort those who remember past sacrifices and guide us in building a just and peaceful community for all. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. A prayer for COP27. God of blessings, the universe sings of your glory. Deepen our gratitude for all you have made and awaken in us a renewed commitment to care for the earth and for each other. Inspire world leaders at COP27 with openness to listen to those most affected by climate change and with courage to act urgently and wisely so that our common home may be healed and restored and all people and generations to come may delight in it. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Merciful God, we entrust to your tender care those who are ill or in pain, knowing that whenever danger threatens, your everlasting arms are there to hold them safe. Comfort and heal them, and restore them to health and strength. And may those who mourn find solace in your loving arms. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. And now the Collect for Peace. O God, the author of peace and lover of concord, to know you is eternal life, and to serve you is perfect freedom. Defend us, your humble servants, in all assaults of our enemies, that we, surely trusting in your defence, may not fear the power of any adversaries, through the might of Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. And we end with the prayer that Jesus taught us, the Lord's Prayer. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. And in our next song, we declare that we find our hope in Jesus, our Saviour. In Christ alone, my hope is found. <laughs>
as our service comes to an end, can I encourage you to go to our parish website. There you'll find notices containing details of all that is going on in our parish. And with Advent approaching, there is certainly a lot going on. And now we end our service with a prayer of blessing. God the Father, who has given to his Son the name above every name, strengthen us to proclaim Christ as Lord, and the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be among us and remain with us all for evermore. Amen. Mm -hmm.